Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're talking about Tetralogy of Fallot, one of my favorite congenital heart defects to discuss because it's actually made up of four different defects all put together. So let's kick it off with our practice question. Remember to hang on to this because we will come back to the correct answer and rationale at the end. So you are the nurse caring for an infant diagnosed with Tetralogy of Fallot. They start crying and become intensely cyanotic, with a heart rate of 180. What's your priority nursing action? Is it A, to prepare the infant for immediate intubation? B, administer IV fluids and place them in high fowlers? C, calm the infant and place them in knees to chest? Or D, notify the provider and begin CPR? So first, let's jump into exactly what tetralogy of flow is. I mentioned it's a heart defect with four components. Those are a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, a right ventricular hypertrophy, and an overriding aorta. So taking those one at a time, first we have the ventricular septal defect, or you probably have heard it called a VSD. So ventricular, it's between the two ventricles, those bottom chambers of the heart. Septum, that's the wall that separates them. And then defect, that means that septum has a defect or a hole in it, and it's going to allow blood to move from the right to the left side of the heart when it should not. That's number one, VSD. Number two, we have that pulmonary stenosis. So over on the right side of the heart, that pulmonary valve and artery that should be bringing blood to the lungs has become narrowed, thick, and stiff. That makes it really hard for the right ventricle to pump blood forward and out to the lungs which results in our third defect, right ventricular hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means something gets bigger and stronger. And just like with any muscle, the harder you work it, the more it hypertrophies. The right ventricle is getting bigger because it's working really hard to pump blood through that pulmonary valve that has pulmonary stenosis. Our fourth and final defect is an overriding aorta. We know normally our aorta should be over the left ventricle and the left ventricle only so that it can pick up nice red oxygenated blood and get it out to the body. In an overriding aorta, it sits over this nice big VSD, our first defect. That means that blood from the right side can get into that aorta and go out to the body. And when that happens, we have our TET spells, which is really why you need to learn about Tetralogy of Flow. So TET spells happen when we get that blue deoxygenated blood going out to the body and the infant becomes profoundly cyanotic very quickly. This happens when we get blood on the right side of the heart going across that VSD and out that overriding aorta to the body. Now, usually blood's just going, you know, right out to lungs, to the left side of the heart, out to the body. No problem. It's following the path of least resistance. But if we get a lot of pressure in that pulmonary circuit, so in the lungs, that is going to put even more pressure on the right side. And blood is really not going to want to go through that stenosed pulmonary valve and out to these high pressure lungs. It's going to follow the path of least resistance and just boop, shunt across the VSD and go out to the body. Now let's think, what increases that pulmonary resistance, especially in babies? <clears throat> Something they do a lot, crying. Anytime they get irritated and they cry, pressure in their lungs goes up, more pressure on the right, blood moves from right to left, and goes out to the body. They become really cyanotic really, really fast. I will never forget the first time I saw this happen. I was pretty new to working in the pediatric cardiac ICU, really big, large academic institution, and I was doubled for the shift. So I had two uh, babies that I was taking care of. Well, one was a new baby. One was like one years old. So anywho, this new baby, he was maybe six hours old. 
They knew there was some sort of cardiac defect because he had a murmur that was really pronounced at delivery and a little bit of like cyanosis around his fingertips, but they hadn't been able to do an echo yet to totally diagnose, hey, what is the problem? And they hadn't seen anything prenatally. So we had a new baby. We knew he needed an echo. At the moment, he was asleep, resting peacefully. Mom had just gone back up to the postpartum unit so she could take a nap. I was like, call you if anything goes wrong. He's asleep. He looks perfect. He's on the monitor. I go over to the one-year-old's room I was taking care of. I think I had to like drop an NG tube or something. Can't totally remember. But what I do completely remember is there is this window between the two rooms so I could look through it and I could keep an eye on that baby next door. So I'm doing whatever I was doing, dropping an NG tube. I look up at the monitor and I see that the baby has woken up. He's crying. I'm like, oh, he's probably hungry. He needs to eat. Well, I watch that blue line for his pulse ox go from like 95 to 80, 70, 60. I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) what's going on over there? I'm like, ah, I'm alone in this room. I drop what I'm doing, make sure this baby's safe you know, hustle my booty over to the other room. By the time I get in there, the pull socks is not even reading. And this baby is blue. I mean, like blue, blue, completely blue. I hit the call bell, the rapid response button. I'm like, I need to get some help in here. Everybody rushes in. Again, I was in a large academic institution. So there were like 50 people in the room. That's I'm being a little bit dramatic, maybe more like 10 people. You've got your attending, your fellow, your resident, your charge nurse, RT, like everybody runs in and everybody starts doing different things all at once. Now, given how quickly this baby's oxygen saturation dropped and the fact that it happened right after he started crying, everybody in the room is like, do we think that this is a tet? This is a classic tet spell. So we're going to treat it like a classic tet spell. Okay. My priority at that point is to calm that baby down. He is hollering screaming. I assume he just woke up because he was hungry, but the more he screamed, the worse it got. So I swaddle him up. I'm rocking. I'm patting. And then I bring his knees up to his chest, put him in knee to chest position. Why was calming him down my first intervention? Are you over there like Morgan? Um, He's blue. Give him oxygen. Well, no, he's not blue because of a lack of oxygen. He's blue because he's screaming increasing his pulmonary resistance that is pushing on the right side of his heart and causing a right to left shunt so that that deoxygenated blood on the right side actually goes out the overriding aorta to the body. So I know if I can calm him down, that pulmonary pressure drops. He doesn't shunt right to left and we start getting oxygenated blood out to the body again. That's what I'm trying to do. Why am I positioning him knees to chest? Well, I want to try and get the systemic pressure up. If I can get the systemic pressure to be a little higher than the pulmonary pressure, that's going to put pressure on that left side and push against that right to left shunt. That's the same reason that one of the nurses who ran in went ahead and grabbed a normal saline flush so we could do a little fluid bolus. Now, this is like a six-hour-old baby, so literally the bolus, like the 10 per kilo bolus, was like a saline flush. We didn't have like a whole bag, right? Totally different than in adults. But it's the same principle. If I got that systemic pressure up, it was going to push against that right-to-left shunt. Now, other things that are going on, somebody gave morphine, and yes, somebody threw oxygen on this baby. We had to always have oxygen set up, ready to go at the bedside. He's blue, 100%. They started giving some oxygen. It was able to come off pretty quickly. He didn't have like an oxygen demand or a need for extra oxygen. He had a need to be calmed down so that pulmonary pressure was lower. And that is why morphine is always the drug of choice in TET spells. If you're dealing with a test question, you're like, what is the pharmacology intervention for TET spells? The answer is morphine. It is going to relax that infundibular muscle that is causing some spasm and increasing that right to left shunt. So that really, really helps. Also, it just calms them down. Who's not calm after a little bit of morphine, right? Baby goes to sleep very quickly after that. He's pink. Oxygen comes off. Crisis averted. All right. So all of that great for treating the TET spell. That is really the acute management and the prioritization that you are for sure going to need on your exams. 
Long term, though, you guys can probably guess that managing tet means surgery, okay? One thing that's interesting is usually, as long as baby is stable, we like to send them home to grow for around about six months before we actually do the surgery. If they are severely hypoxic, not growing, not meeting milestones, then we might do it earlier. But as long as they're stable, we kind of like to get some more real estate going on to work with so the surgery is a little easier, hopefully is more successful. The surgery is a couple of key things. They're going to patch that VSD so we don't have the shunting anymore. And they are going to widen that narrowed pulmonary valve. And that's going to help with the right ventricular hypertrophy. So that's considered a TET repair. Again, usually around about six months. But do keep in mind that's highly individualized. And the cardiac surgeon is going to plan for each individual client what is ideal for them. But if they are going to go home and and grow for more around about six months, we need to teach parents how to respond to TET spells. Babies are going to cry. They are going to have a TET spell in those six months. As long as we can respond very quickly, like we saw with my new kiddo that I was taking care of, crisis averted, right? We can keep things under control. But we need to teach parents how to recognize a TET spell, what a potential trigger can be so they can catch it early how to comfort and calm, position them in knees to chest, and of course, when to seek emergency help. So all that being said, let's circle back to our original question. Hopefully now you can get the right answer and know why. You are a nurse caring for an infant with tetralogy of flow. They begin crying, become cyanotic, have a heart rate of 180. What is your priority action? As a reminder, we had A, prepare for immediate intubation, B, administer IV fluids and put them in high fowlers. C, calm and placed in knees to chest position. And D, notify the provider and begin CPR. So think it through. Yell your answer out loud with me. It is C, comfort and calm, get them in knees to chest. Remember, they are cyanotic because there is high pulmonary pressure. That's pushing on the right side and causing a right to left shunt. That's causing blue blood to go out to the body. So if I can reduce those pulmonary pressures by comforting and calming, then I'm not going to be cyanotic anymore. And that's why comfort and calm is always your priority intervention. Even though they're blue, we don't need to prepare for intubation, okay? Intubation is definitely not the first step and usually not necessary in TET spells. B, giving IV fluids, well, yes, that would help. But in high fowlers, no, no, no. Knees to chest. Remember, knees to chest increases that systemic pressure, and that's going to help reduce the right to left shunting. IV fluids, that does the same thing. That's why we give sometimes a 10 per kilo bolus to get that systemic pressure up. Are either of those the priority? Nope. Priority, comfort, and calm. And lastly, notifying the provider and starting CPR, well, that's premature. If they lose a pulse, they're unresponsive, then we might start CPR. But normally, if we catch a TET spell quickly and act fast, we're not going to have to do CPR, which really is why that key takeaway is prioritizing comfort and calm the infant. If you're able to do that, you reduce their pulmonary pressure. You reduce the right to left shunt and less deoxygenated blood goes out the overriding aorta to the body. They will pink up very quickly and you have just avoided intubation, CPR, and all these other invasive efforts. So TED spells, very, very scary. Know that when they become irritable and profoundly cyanotic right afterwards, it is very likely a TED spell and your priority, comfort and calm. Right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on demand video lectures, high yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. 
Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.